Dear Ben, your mom has been sending us pictures of all of the amazing things you've been creating. Looking forward to one day owning a Ben Ben blue hat. You can call your company when you get one, Benny Ben Originals. My granny sent me that message a couple of weeks ago, along with the Billy Crystal joke. These are words of encouragement and support from my grandparents, which are not out of the ordinary. She sent me messages like this ever since I got on Facebook, commenting on every small project I've done or I've been a part of. This time, however, those words meant a lot more than any other time it was said. Let me explain why. Ever since my first day at green school in grade four, I felt like I could do anything. Honestly, I thought I could just sail passion fruit boats with Chayden and explore down by the river, collect eggs from the chicken coop and vegetables from the class gardens as a part of my education until the day that I graduated. And then middle school came along. The older kids, the quest projects, the algebra classes, it soon became clear to me that I would have to bear more responsibilities compared to my primary school life. So sailing through middle school, we had finally made it the eighth grade. And it was time to do a quest project, but what to do? So a guideline for quest is you have to do something that relates to social justice or sustainability. And so at the time, it was 2015, and forests were burning in Borneo, and they were disappearing, and so were orangutans, and so tree was born. Some of you might already know what tree is, and some of you might know me for being a part of tree. But for those who don't, let my past self explain. Hello everybody, my name is Ben Fidgel, and I'm the co-founder of a social enterprise called Tree Upcycle. So Tree raises awareness about deforestation and supports forest protectors in Indonesia. We want people all around the world to give a damn about Indonesia's forests and want them to understand how their consumption contributes to deforestation in Indonesia. So why would anyone in New York or Paris or Vancouver give a damn about Indonesia's forests? So, to recap, Tree is a social enterprise and we're all about upcycling. We take in discarded fabrics and we turn them into products to promote conscious consumption. With the profits that we make from selling these products, we send to grassroots organizations that are on the ground doing something to protect Indonesia's forests. Did you catch all that? It was pretty fast, but that was the elevator pitch that I had memorized for Tree over the past four years. I must have said it to over a thousand people. But there was just something missing from it. It was missing heart and authenticity. So, picture this. It's December 2017, and I'm in my first semester of grade 10. And at this point, tree presentations are coming very easily to me, I'm just rolling off my tongue. I'm at the end of a six-month journey that took me all around the world, and I've given presentations in a dozen countries to audiences, large and small, for tree. I find myself walking in a back alley in Bhaktapur, Kathmandu, on the way to this presentation. We're late but I'm dragging my heels. My dad's walking 200 meters in front of me, but I'm not trying to catch up. I'm finally coming to grips with the difference between a passion and a duty. You see, I care about orangutans. I care about Indonesia's forest, and I did want to do something to contribute. I wanted to fulfill my school's expectation of me being a green leader, but this isn't my passion. This cause is not what lights my fire. So I tell my dad I want out of tree. I don't want to do this presentation. But my dad reminded me of a previous commitment I'd made. Hundreds of people were already waiting for me to do a presentation that I was already late for. So this wasn't the time to back out. However, I had a very important realization then and there. Did I have a passion for protecting Indonesia's forests? No, not really. But that's not to say it wasn't something that I still believed in and supported. When it came to my interests, I was, confused and, 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 and I was confused and unable to separate what I believed was the right thing to do and what would actually get me out of bed in the morning. Something that I was genuinely passionate about. Now imagine this. It's March 2020, and after changing my greenstone topic over seven times, I come at a crossroads. At the beginning of this year, I was thinking of creating a collection of clothing that included Balinese symbols. But, me being an international person, using Balinese symbols, to me, I thought that that would cause offense. So I dropped it. And by the time it was February, I had an internship at Starter Lab, and I was trying to get my foot in the door in the sourdough world. 
So in the first week of quarantine, when COVID hit, I was stuck at home asking myself yet again, was sourdough the thing that excited me? Was I making loaves of loaves of bread? No, not really. And I found myself feeling the exact same way as I was feeling when I was walking to that presentation in Kathmandu. Asking myself, was this really what I cared about in my heart of hearts? Or was this just a good story about bringing people together and making bread? In my head, I found that the concept that I created for my project had just been contrived just so that I would have a greenstone topic. And I came to the conclusion that it's really not what I wanted to do. Bread wasn't my thing. Bread wasn't my driving force. But what was? Rewind. So it's grade eight, and I start caring more and more about my appearance. So I start shopping at fast fashion stores like H&M and Zara with my mom, just to get the essentials. And once I start wearing those clothes, I immediately start feeling better about the way I look. It's grade nine, and I begin wanting to wear more unique clothing, so I start thrifting. I would thrift at Kas Pasar Kodok, and I would thrift at uh, Goodwills in Canada over the summer. And I would collect vintage t-shirts and pants, and I would start having a more unique style. In grade 10, I got more into mainstream brands like Bape and Palace and Supreme, and it was all about the hype. And I would line outside in the cold for hours in London just to get a t-shirt with a brand name slapped on it for $60. In grade 11, my friend Flynn showed me Japanese designers, and I start growing an interest for that. So I would look online on this site called Grailed for hours just to find pieces of Yoji Yamamoto or Number no. 9 or Comme des Garçons, all of these brands. So halfway through my grade 11 year, I took my first ever sewing class with an ex-green school parent named Antonia. This was for Jalan Jalan, and it was about how to make clothes, and she taught me the absolute basics how to make a pattern, what seam allowance was, and how to operate an industrial sewing machine. And during this class, I had this idea. I wanted to make a pair of pants that had a half circle on each leg, so when I put my legs together, it would make a whole circle. See, I wasn't into design. There was no deeper meaning behind the circle. I just wanted to have a pair of pants that had a circle on it. And I wanted these pair of pants on my body, like right now. And six weeks later, during these classes, never finished them. They were left as a half-done project that laid in my room for another year. I had also proceeded to complete a design course with a green school parent named Taya, who had taught me how to make mood boards and color schemes, crochets, and how to make a collection cohesive. Fast forward to my grade 12 year, I'd begun taking sewing classes with another green school parent named Valerie, who was always patient with me. And she helped me finish my first ever piece of clothing. This is what it looks like. There was no better feeling to me than wearing something that I made, with her help, of course. And then I was halfway done with another pair of shorts I was making until the class suddenly came to an end. See, all of these experiences sewing was not enough for me to just make anything I wanted out of thin air, but it was enough for me to want to. I finally had this feeling of wanting to do something, not for anybody else, but for me. I wanted to make my own clothes so that I would have something that no one else had, something that you couldn't find at a shop or at a thrift store, online. So I took a break from sewing I had a machine, but I hadn't used it since Valerie's class ended. And until COVID hit, I was focusing on another greenstone topic about sourdough bread. Then around March 14th, when COVID got more serious, my family decided on a two week quarantine, no in and out of the house, absolute lockdown. And I think I speak for everyone when I say that I was really, 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 really bored for those two weeks. And then during those two weeks, I remembered I had a machine, but I didn't have any fabric. So I had to improvise. I looked around the house and I found all these old cushion covers. I cut them up, made huge sheets of fabric out of them. And from then on, it was really just up to my imagination. I started with a mask. Why buy a mask in the store? 
if you could just learn one, learn how to make one. So I did. I learned how to make a beach hat. I made four. I made a bag. I made a bag with dog print on it to put my dog inside. And then I made a bag that was shaped and looked like a mushroom. Why? Because no one was there telling me I couldn't make a bag that was shaped like a mushroom. No one was telling me that the mushroom bag wasn't part of the assignment. So I finally had creative freedom. I moved on. Remember those pants I was talking to you about, the circle pants? I finished them, and I'm wearing them right now, and I love them. <laughs> I made a pattern for a kimono-looking jacket, and with a bit of prior knowledge of how to make one, I winged it, and it turned out better than I expected. I wanted to make cargo pants, so I tore up a light green cushion cover, I cut out my pattern, I uh, cut pockets, and I cut uh, cargo pockets as well, and then I just had to assemble. But I wasn't too familiar of how to put the whole thing together. So one day, I went to the tailor. And this tailor, this guy, has been what my family has been sending our stuff to for the past couple of years. When we have a rip in our clothing, when we need a little bit of tailoring, we always just send it to this guy. And I never met him in person. So I did meet him in person. And his name was Dedek. And off the bat, he was super, super friendly. He told me that I could come work in his shop after I told him that I had an interest in making my own clothing. I then took out my clothes. I showed him the clothes that I had had. And you know what he said? He said, you'll never have a clothing brand of your own if the quality is this bad. He said, your clothes aren't touched up. The insides should be surged. It's overall sloppy. And my God, did he have a point? He had a point. I hadn't even realized that the stuff that I'd been making had a completely unfinished look. And here I was getting verbally destroyed by the local tailor on the side of the road. The thing was, I wasn't even mad. I needed to hear all that. Besides, this is the thing that has finally started to ignite my passion. When he said all of these things about the clothes I made, I was glad to know that there was so much more that I could learn. Learning. You know, it's interesting what happens in life when a little bit of school gets out of the way. I'd like to give a quick shout out to my teacher, Pak Mo, and Pak Noan for standing their ground on student-directed learning and meeting me where I was at. Leap gave me the skills to activate and to create with whatever I had around me. I didn't jump through all the hoops. I've never been that great at um, my grades and doing well at school. I didn't meet all of the expectations that were put on me by my parents or by my teachers or by the school. And sometimes receiving comments like this on my report card didn't feel all around constructive or encouraging. And I never felt like I was succeeding as a whole. But this was part of the process of being true to myself, figuring out who I am and what matters to me. This process has been about me learning to do things on my own terms and for my own reasons. So let's bring it back to the very beginning when I got that message from my granny on Facebook. I didn't just see it as just a supportive message. I saw it as a report card that I never had. The report card that I've always wanted to see. Somebody validating and supporting my work and who I really was. This was authentically me. This is Benny Ben Originals. Thank you.